Okay, let's go. I think we are already connected uh, uh, at the seminar series of uh, EMED on Mediterranean and uh, and also uh, uh, this is an event also uh, at the crossroad of, of, of several uh, also seminar series. Huh? The first one is of course the EMED uh, at the Mediterranean, but also the greeting uh, uh, seminar series at uh, University Pompeu Fabra. And uh, also, uh, we welcome um, most of the master students of all Master on Migration Studies from Pompeo Fabra that have uh, this lecture also as a compulsory uh, uh, um, event for them. Uh, of course, I, I welcome all the audience. I, I know that you are, we are more than the, than the students from the master, and uh, I hope uh, we will enjoy uh, um, the topic that, uh, that will, uh, will be with us uh, today. Um, uh, the topic will be on, on transnationalism and integration in comparative perspective, and we will take the case of Albanian immigrants in Vienna and Athens. Huh? Um, this uh, lecture will be held by uh, Dr. Eda Jemi, uh, who is a member of Euromedmich uh, Studying Committee. Euromedmich is a platform of um, researchers working on Mediterranean migration, coordinated by also uh, Greetin. And, uh, and uh, we are very pleased also within the seminar series to receive her. Uh, she is a political sociologist specialized on, on governance on migration and integration. And she's currently also associate uh, uh, professor uh, at the University of New York of uh, Tirana. Since uh, 2010, uh, she is also research fellow at Robert Schumann Center at, uh, of, of Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. Uh, and also have been also head of uh, migration at LEMAP, uh, uh, an international Hellenic uh, foundation on the European and foreign policy at Athens. Uh, um, just uh, maybe to refer to some books uh, from, uh, from uh, Dr. Jamie, uh, because she has authored uh, several books on migration, integration and transnationalism, and also on EU Western Balkan migration system. Uh, indeed, uh, Eda Jemi is with us in the steering committee of Euromedmich as uh, some kind of um, uh, covering uh, uh, the Balkan uh, area uh, of the Mediterranean. Uh, nothing more to say, uh, just to welcome her, uh, to thank her also uh, to be there with us. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will also uh, try to follow uh, by PowerPoint and, and um, by screen also uh, the lecture. Just some logistics before uh, giving the floor to uh, uh, Jamie uh, for question and answer. I know that this is not the best way uh, to do that uh, because we cannot use uh, the voice option, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, you have the option of the queue and answers. Uh, and uh, I have myself a screen uh, just uh, um, visible for the queue and answers. And I will, I will be pleased uh, uh, to take uh, uh, all the questions that will uh, be written and to transfer uh, this question to Eda Jemek. I hope that we will also have the opportunity to have a debate around that. And then I motivate you to use, and uh, not be shy, uh, and to use uh, this means. Also, um, through YouTube, you are also um, um, uh, able uh, uh, to write a few answers and then this question will be transferred to me. And then I will try to manage also the debate after the uh, Eda Jemis uh, lecture. Uh, welcome Eda Jemis and the floor is yours. And thank you again for being with us. And a shame that we cannot meet in person, but I am sure this uh, would be also the opportunity to meet uh, uh, and to reinforce also our, our commitment uh, with Euromedmich and also uh, with, uh, with Barcelona and EMF. Thank you for, for uh, to be there. Um, thank you, Ricard, for your kind words and the, let's say, warm welcome. It is my privilege to be with you. Thank you very much for having me, for invitation, uh, for being part, a member of your, uh, your Euromedmic committee, which is actually doing a wonderful work uh, on the Mediterranean migration. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Yemed. It's not the first time that I'm actually uh, collaborating with them. My first, let's say, uh, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Yemed was in 2015 when I visited Amman and take part in a common, let's say, uh, project on uh, refugee crisis at that time uh, in the Mediterranean. So uh, without uh, taking more time, uh, I'm actually uh, uh, 
sharing the PowerPoint uh, with you. Sorry, probably there is. Um... Uh, actually, as you uh, presented my, my topic, it has to do with the project that I did um, in, uh, in Austria in 2018. It was a study project funded by uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences, and the topic was exactly integration and transnationalism. And my case study, it's um, the uh, Albanian migration from a cross-national and cross-local perspective, which means uh, comparing both Austria and Greece, and at local level, Vienna and, and Athens. Um, Issues, I'm so... trying to share my my PowerPoint, but I see that there is okay now. Okay. Uh, you are, I think, you are actually uh, seeing it. You see it on your screen, my PowerPoint. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe you can you can put it. Uh, uh, okay, in I can full, open. Full screen. Perfect. Perfect. So actually, as you see, this is the title of my of my study that was published. Um, in this research uh, series of, uh, or let's say a kind of a book uh, published by uh, Austrian Academy of Science and Institute of, uh, for Urban and Re uh, Regional Research based in Vienna. As um, uh, I'm try I, I tried to, uh, you know, to make things a little bit more uh, easy and simple for uh, my and your audience, uh, actually, as you see uh, on your screens, uh, the study seeks to identify the patterns of interaction. This is, let's say, an added value when it comes to uh, two terms uh, that are uh, commonly used in migration studies, uh, the patterns of interaction between integration and transnationalism, but under a specific context-bound national conditions. Uh, I did so by applying a comparative across national and cross local perspective, focusing on two receiving countries, namely uh, Greece and Austria, that represent different migration and integration regimes. Uh, so cross local perspective, Vienna and, uh, and Athens. Uh, my, uh, let's say primary research uh, was uh, based or was conducted um, or adapted, employed a multi-sided ethnographic fieldwork. Uh, um, I conducted at that time 30 interviews, 15 in Vienna and 15 in Athens with Albanian migrants of different, let's say, background and uh, my, uh, categories, and also with key informants uh, that actually uh, represented uh, local governance, I mean, uh, municipality of Vienna and municipality uh, of uh, Athens. Uh, when it comes to analytical framework, uh, I uh, actually uh, choose to employ a typological so, paradigm. So, so, sorry that to interrupt you, but uh, sometimes there is a black screen that comes. Uh, I don't know because maybe you 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 click uh, twice in your. But in any case, we now now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. Ah, perfect. So. Now it's Actually, Sorry, no, 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 no. It's for the sake of you know of the of the lecture and of uh, you know for your for audiences to better understand what we're talking about. Uh, so actually, uh, the analytical framework uh, was based on migration systems. So the migration systems, uh, as we all know, uh, has to do with a set of sending and receiving countries which uh, those two ends uh, uh, of, you know, receiving and uh, origin countries are actually experiencing similar in and outflows. So in this context, uh, I um, did my research in Greece and Austria, which both countries uh, are used uh, as typological paradigm of EU uh, Western Balkans migration subsystem. It is not the first time that uh, there is a study 
on EU Western Balkan uh, migration subsystem when I was head of um, migration team at Eliamep in 2012-2016. Actually, we had a, a, a project, a research project, uh, which was actually focused on governance of irregular migration by comparing different uh, migration system, among which was, uh, was again uh, EU uh, Western uh, Balkans migration subsystem. What are the common, uh, let's say, similarities or characteristics that, um, let's say, uh, make the Western Balkan migration system different comparing to other migration system or subsystems? Actually, um, heterogeneity and multiple dynamics of migration trajectories uh, changes as, uh, for instance, economic crisis occurring in migration systems that, that trigger let's say, a change of directions and to actually uh, put forth different tra trajectories, uh, strong uh, ethnic networks that actually create um, the migration chain. And of course, uh, the role of migrants agency vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, structure, which actually is a micro level of uh, my approach. So this is in a, in a way, uh, in a nutshell, the analytical framework within which I try to make sense and to explore, uh, uh, let's say, integration, interconnection between integration and transnationalism in the case of Albanian migrants in Vienna uh, and Athens uh, at local level and uh, uh, Austria and Greece at national levels. So. Uh, in order to make a little bit more uh, simple and to uh, put my topic into um, broader perspective, uh, I would like to uh, drilling a little bit deeper uh, on what does it mean migration system? Because uh, I have actually used a migration system as an umbrella uh, within which I have accommodated my, 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 my research. So, uh, what does it mean, migration system? How migration system uh, actually uh, 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 are formated? So actually a combination of economic and demographic elements with high level of connectivity or interdependency between core and uh, countries of periphery uh, using, you know, the Emmanuel Wallerstein uh, world system theory, core countries, uh, industrialized one and countries of periphery. So this is the first one. The second has to do with feedback mechanisms. So uh, uh, let's say flows patterned by the structural interdependencies between those two ends, meaning core countries and countries of periphery, or translated it in a more simple way, receiving on the countries of origin. Uh, what makes those two ends uh, in a way uh, part of migration system is exactly the stable mobility of people for a, a long time or for, you know, in a, in, a, in a concrete time span, which means that this table of movement and flows between particular cities, countries, region together with flow of goods, capital, ideas, and information. So in a way, this stable uh, chain uh, of movement of people from specific geographical region, which are original uh, countries of origin, and uh, to destination countries create the flows and counterflows that actually shape the dynamic of migration uh, trajectories and corridors, which we call here migration system. So actually, this dynamic of flows, as I already mentioned, create its, you know, put forth a creation of an identifiable geographic structure that persists across space and time. So this is a nutshell uh, what uh, how migration system actually takes form. Uh, another theoretical, theoretical, uh, let's say, uh, approach that try to make sense and to understand um, migration system and the dynamic of 
uh, migration corridors between receiving and uh, origin countries is, uh, as you know, cumulative causation effect. Uh, the cumulative causation effect linked past migration corridors with uh, settlement, you know, with settle of migrants that generate this migration flows. And of course, this cumulative causation effect is put forth or in a way uh, it's boosted or enhanced by transnational communities. There are transnational communities that create further mainstreaming of migration flows. So is the transnational capital of people uh, and so on. Another additional contextual feedback mechanism that goes beyond the receiving uh, countries uh, reality, which means that actually in the space of transnationalism, we're not only talking about uh, receiving countries, but actually we're talking receiving country and origin country. So actually the equation here is much more advanced comparing to the classical and traditional, let's say, uh, thought about integration by viewing it only from the country, from the perspective of country uh, of, uh, of destination. Uh, so actually we have the emergence of a culture of migration, uh, which is strongly associated with individuals' socioeconomic success, which means that once, uh, let's say an ethnic group or a migration flow has been established in a, in a country, in a destination country, this creates a kind of incentives for other migrants coming from the same country to join them. And this is uh, uh, called in a way, uh, this is part of the culture of migration that actually goes beyond the push and pull factors as you, Ricard, very well know, which are the classical uh, economic approach, uh, new economics of migration uh, studies. So uh, actually, what does it mean or what cultural of migration implies? It's uh, actually that migration turns into an increasing trend or even mainstreaming it as a prevailing social norm of upward mobility. So in countries like Albania, for instance, when I, uh, I, ca when I come from, uh, let's say, actually by uh, being or being exposed to migration is a way, uh, it's part of the cultural of migration, as I mentioned before, which is embedded uh, in social norm and actually uh, help people or um, uh, in a way create this kind of, uh, let's say, dynamic uh, upward mobility, which, as you know, is one of the, uh, uh, the, the most significant, let's say, motivation uh, of migration, especially when we talk about first uh, generation. Um, so in order to wrap up a little bit, I'm going to present here uh, uh, in key, you know, in key points, uh, migration system profile. So actually, uh, migration system profile is a set of interacting uh, elements, flow of people, ideas, uh, capital and, good, and goods. Secondly, social institutions embedded in the culture of migration as we already uh, uh, saw. Third, strategies employed by particular actors, uh, units of analysis in a way, uh, for instance, individuals, uh, households, policy making, civil society organization at both ends. So again, I'm insisting that in our picture, we have two we take for granted or take as given uh, two countries, countries uh, country of destination and country of origin. So we cannot talk about transnationalism, we cannot talk about uh, migration systems without uh, adding in our, let's say, equation, uh, those both countries. So actually, when we talk about um, uh, migration systems, actually, we uh, immediately paint out three levels uh, or three way uh, in way of integration, country of origin, country of destination, and the migrants themselves. And the fourth one, 
is socioeconomic dynamics, uh, why those systemic elements are very important, because in a way they shape the dynamic in which the above element, this is the, let's say, uh, uh, systemic or macro level uh, of approach. So there are socio socioeconomic dynamics that shapes the way in which the, all the above elements at micro and, and meso level actually change as a response to transformations and changes happened in one system. An example, Greece and Italy, uh, economic crisis, 2013, 2014 till 2017, we have a shift in uh, integration dynamics of Albanians uh, in both countries. Actually, we have an increasing flow of returnees uh, going back to Albania in search for a better conditions because they lost their jobs, they lapsed back, back into irregularity because of the uh, precariousness of um, legal uh, resident permits in both countries. I'm talking about Italy and Greece. Uh, and on the other hand, we have other migration or other groups, especially uh, that of uh, second generation, who actually uh, draw a different trajectory by migrating to other countries of European Union, uh, more stable economies like United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Belgium, and so, and, uh, and so on. So actually we have a differentiation, so the change caused by socioeconomic dyna dynamics in destination countries, Greece, Italy, actually create uh, uh, migrants, both as uh, individuals and as group, uh, you know, embark on a new trajectory as a response to the exclusion experience in countries, in the first countries of destination. Uh, what is the added value of uh, trying to explore uh, interconnection between my integration and transnationalism in the case of Austria and Greece? And why I actually employed the migration system approach in order uh, to create this kind of framework, analytical framework uh, for the exploration of, uh, of interconnection between integration and transnationalism, because actually it allows us uh, for conceptualization of migration beyond the traditional linear unidirectional push and pull movement, movement as I mentioned before. At the same time, we realized, we acknowledge that migration phenomenon, it's a multi, uh, uh, multi phase, you know, it's, it's a very dynamic one. Uh, we have circular, multi causal, and interdependent uh, migration flows with the effect of change in one part of the system being traceable through the rest of the systems. I mentioned before economic crisis. Uh, the irregularization of migrants, exclusion, marginalization in both Greek and Italian labor market uh, triggered another corridor uh, and changed this. Let's say we have the shift of one uh, migration system to another. So destinations now are not anymore Greece and Italy, but United Kingdom, Germany, even United States. Uh, so migration system can be uh, self-feeding through chain migration, self-regulating. Uh, why? Because, uh, you know, actually we're talking about the ability to shape dynamics according to the scale and magnitude of the systemic crisis, a uh, self-modifying through the shift of migration flows to a different destination when the initial destination has been exhausted, as I mentioned before, uh, taking as an example the case of Italy, and, and particularly the case uh, of Greece. Uh, now, trying to narrow down a little bit our approach from the big picture of migration system to a smaller one, to EU, which is uh, actually um, the field of, of uh, my, uh, my research, EU migration system, we are actually, uh, uh, we have, four systems uh, within the migration, with, within the EU migration system. And of course, you are all aware of uh, those systems. 
uh, southern EU countries, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy, northwestern EU countries, Scandinavian countries, uh, characterized by a generous welfare system, a new EU accession countries um, that joined uh, EU family uh, in 2004-2005 uh, uh, and 2006 with Bulgaria, 2007 with Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, so um, what are, uh, let's say, why we're actually talking about EU migration uh, subsystem? Because actually we have the emergent, emergence and evolution of those subsystems. Why? Because there is a high level of interconnectedness between migration dynamics, which is actually shaped by historical context and present forms, and uh, all the background that include elements like cultural, economic, political, and so on. At the same time, there is a privileged relations between receiving and sending countries. Uh, for instance, we know that in the case of Greece, uh, there, is a mi uh, there is a minority, a Greek minority in Albania, which actually uh, enjoy a, a specific place uh, in the Greek legal system, uh, which create a kind of differentiation between integration of Albanians and the integration of Albanians, but of Greek origin. Uh, or in the case of other countries of European Union, like Bel Belgium or uh, the Netherlands, we have the former colonies, which actually uh, has or enjoy different uh, privileges or rights uh, due to historical links or uh, in uh, the countries of destination. And at the same time, we are actually talking about largely linked uh, those two ends by cultural and political affin affinities historically rooted in receiving and sending countries. Uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, Serbia, uh, in 1960s, uh, they were actually migrated uh, to Germany and Austria uh, in the context or uh, it, uh, these movements were was regulated by bilateral um, agreement between Germany and uh, at that time, former Yugoslavia. Uh, you know, uh, the recruitment of, uh, of, uh, of workers. Now, narrowing even more uh, our approach by uh, looking at EU Western Balkans migration subsystem, uh, we have trajectories within the EU Western uh, Balkan migration system, just for, uh, for your information, for your students' information, we're actually talking about uh, Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro, and North Macedonia. Those are the countries that actually are named Western Balkan uh, uh, countries, which all, you know, all together, actually, they are candidate uh, countries, uh, and uh, they actually are trying hard uh, to open up the negotiation with European Union and become a uh, member of European European family. Uh, so there are trajectories of migration corridors in the Western Balkans that are uh, directly linked with the hist history of the region, historical relationship, uh, Croatia with Austria, Serbs and Bosnia-Herzegovina with Germany, Albania with Greece, Albania with Italy, and so forth. Uh, Pre-existence of migrant network. It's not by coincidence that, for instance, in Austria, uh, the, the largest migration group is from Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's not something new. It has to do with the initial migration of those, let's say, um, people of, from those countries in 60s, as I mentioned before. And of course, selective migration policies applied by receiving countries. We know very well that uh, both Germany and Austria uh, in 90s actually employed uh, a selective migration policies from migrants coming from Bosnia Herzegovina and Serbia. Why? Because uh, there, for, for reasons that has to do with their, uh, let's say, um, way that they want to manage uh, migration policies and integration uh, at the domestic level. Uh, so what are the basic features of Western Balkans migration patterns? Uh, ethnic complexities, and historical conflicts and controversies, 
that often uh, fueled ethnic conflicts. The case of Bosnia Herzegovina in, in 1995, Kosovo in 1999, and how all these ethnic, let's say, conflicts uh, generated migration flows towards European Union. Uh, the economic transformation that took place uh, uh, after the, the collapse of Soviet Union in 90s, and of course, political actors who caused the destabilization of the entire region. Again, a Balkans war in the beginning of 90s, war for independence from, uh, uh, from uh, let's say, from former Yugoslavia, what happened in, in Croatia, in Slovenia in 1991, 1992, uh, what happened in Bosnia Herzegovina, the bloody war. Uh, and massacres in the in the and the genocide that took place in Bosnia in the beginning of the 90s and the whole let's say uh, um, uh, breakdown of uh, of former Yugoslavia was culminating with intervention of Na of NATO in 1999 uh, uh, in uh, in the conflict between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, so as you see. Actually, the Western Balkans share some similarities that actually uh, give shape to the, those migration uh, corridors that I mentioned before. So actually, we already talked about old migration before 90s, a new migration, with the exception of Albania, which was an isolated country throughout you know, the Cold War. Uh, all the, 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 the other countries of Western Balkans were in a way exposed or experienced uh, migration through a guest worker recruitment bilateral scheme, as I mentioned before. Now, my focus, of course, was on new migration uh, after 90s. Uh, we have la large scale uh, emigration from Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina to Austria and Germany, Albanian massive uh, uh, exodus of Albanians to two neighboring countries, uh, Greece and Italy, uh, who are both European Union, uh, member of European Union. Uh, the massive exodus of Albania was assumed the proportion of biblical exodus till today. Uh, so those developments, the combination of old and new migration dynamics within the region of First and Balkans actually create, uh, has contributed to the creation, the formation of Western, of EU, Western Balkan migration uh, sub system, which in a way make, make it, uh, or uh, just, you know, make it a little bit unique comparing to other uh, mi migration subsystems. Uh, what are the new types uh, or types of the new migration uh, within the region and towards European Union? Forced migration, uh, fueled by war and uh, ethnic cleansing. Ethnic migration, uh, voluntary repatriation to the ancient motherland. As I mentioned before, the uh, homogenous, homogenous, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, co-ethnic, Greek co-ethnic from Albania to Greece, or uh, house leader in Germany from, you know, uh, people of uh, German origin, uh, going back or repatriating to uh, from Poland uh, to uh, to Germany. Uh, this ethnic migration actually generated special benefits derived from their privileged status, uh, such as uh, special pens uh, pension schemes compared to the rest uh, of uh, Albanian migration or the rest of other uh, migration to Germany. The third one, it's uh, another, let's say, scourge of our region called human trafficking, which is still the case, actually. Uh, the fourth one is labor migration, uh, both in regular and irregular forms, uh, such as circular migration involving semi-skilled and unskilled individuals. And of course, uh, in 2015, we uh, had, we, let's say, uh, so a different form of, uh, of migration, in quote, of course, called economic asylum seekers. Uh, if people from uh, migrants from Serbia, Albania, and Kosovo uh, join the B Balkan corridor, join, you know, the refugee, the, the, let's say, the, um, uh, 
uh, the people, uh, the asylum seekers at that time from Syria trying to reach Europe uh, throughout through the Balkan corridors in 2015, 2016. At that time, over 130,000 uh, 130, migrants from uh, Western Balkans applied for refugee stat status in European Union, uh, with Germany being at the top of the preferred destination countries, uh, you know, uh, among others. So this is a, a typology of new migration uh, uh, in, in the context of Western, uh, of Western Balkans migration uh, system to EU. Uh, let's uh, just have a, picture, a snapshot about numbers. So actually in the beginning of 90s, uh, out of 2.2 million people who were forced to leave Croatia and Borsa Herzegovina, roughly uh, 300,000, uh, more than uh, approximately 400,000 people migrated to Central and Western Europe. Albania, one of the world's highest emigration rates in relation to its population, with a stock of emigrants nearly 39% of the total population. Around 800,000 Albanians, uh, regular migrants, live actually uh, in Greece and Italy. In Austria, Serbia, people uh, from Serbia, Bosnia Herzegovina, and North Macedonia uh, are the largest community uh, in Austria and in Germany also. Uh, in Austria, uh, they are actually overcoming uh, and are more than Turk, the Turkish population migrants there. And actually, uh, migrants from those countries, from Western Balkans, are ranking among the 15 nationalities, uh, top nationalities uh, in Austria. Um, there is a common, uh, let's say, there are common developments uh, in the Western Balkans. Why? Uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to uh, European Union, uh, we have uh, Europeanization of migration policies. Uh, as I mentioned before, all the countries of Western Balkans are actually candidate countries. So uh, actually boundaries between uh, the EU and the Western Balkans are increasingly blurred, pointing at the growing complexity of migration system uh, in the context of uh, the perspective of integration, of EU integration. Actually, um, uh, EU migration policies and EU Western Balkan cooperation migration have seen a, you know, a crucial importance in shaping the migration system. Um, EU Western Balkan cooperation is part of the stabilization and association process of EU relations uh, with the Western Balkans. So actually we have, let's say, a kind of, a, a kind of conversion, uh, which I called Europeanization of migration policies, particularly focused on the control of irregular migration and human trafficking uh, and so on, and not so much on, um, I don't know, regular migration in a way. Uh, what about Albanian immigration in Austria and Greece? Uh, actually, we are talking the case study of Albanians, but actually uh, we are talking of two different countries, two different realities. Uh, as we know, Greece and Austria differ in terms of political organization, model of governance, the economic and labor market structure, and of course, migration and integration patterns. Greece is an unstable country of the southern EU, recently hit hard by two uh, crises, by dual crises, both financial crisis and humanitarian crises. Um, Greece emerged as destination countries at the beginning of 90s, which means that Greece has little experience in managing migration and integration. Uh, Greece and Albania, which is one of the most interesting, let's say, uh, particularities of Greek-Albanian migration. Uh, why? Because Greece and Albania are neighboring countries sharing uh, common borders and sharing common problems related to the creation and formation of nation states in the Balkans in the beginning of 20th century. Uh, minorities on both sides of the borders, some disputes about whatever historical minorities and so on. On the other hand, Austria is a stable country 
with a different migration and integration legacy, representing the Northwestern uh, European uh, regime uh, as we see uh, before. Um, let's see now, just point, uh, let's allow me to point out some cross-national differences. Uh, when it comes to model of governance, Austria is a centralized federal state, a different uh, model of governance. Uh, while Greece is a unitary uh, state, a centralized uh, uh, system, uh, which of course has to do or has an impact on how migration and integration are actually managed. Uh, economic and labor market structure is also different, Northwest, Western versus Southern EU. Migration patterns different, guest worker um, in 60s versus undocumented migration in 90s, uh, well organized in Austria versus less organized migration and integration system in the case of Greece. Similarities, both countries are members of European Union, I mean uh, Austria and, and Greece, uh, large scale presence of migrant population from Western Balkans in both countries, pre-existent historical, political and cultural ties with Albania, uh, you know that Austria, Austrian Hungarian Empire was uh, had a very important role in the creation of Albanian states in the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century. Uh, strategic geographical position in the European map, map, and of course sound presence in the economic and cultural life of Albania, including both Austria and and, and Greece. Uh, cross-national patterns of integration. In both countries, we have a stringent integration policies. Naturalization is very hard to obtain. The whole, let's say, ideology behind the naturalization policies is based on you sanguinis principle. So your blood and not your education or the years of living in a country. But in contrast to Greece, Migrants in Austria have to renounce their previous citizenship or nationality, with, although there are a few exceptions, uh, which is not the case in Greece. So Greece has a more, let's say, uh, uh, let's say liberal uh, naturalization uh, policies because you can uh, keep your whole, you know, keep your both uh, citizenship without renouncing uh, your uh, citizenship of your country of origin. Uh, actually, in both countries, naturalization is seen as a reward, not for integration, but for assimilation. Uh, in both countries, uh, we have uh, naturalization tests, which means include high level of proficiency of both German and Greek language, knowledge of the state, history and culture, and so on. In Austria, uh, the introduction of pre-entry test is seen as a shift towards exclusionary effects in terms of rights and social uh, selectivity. Uh, Cross-local patterns of integration in Athens, uh, we have absence of specific local integration policies, so integration happens by accident. Uh, migrants one-way rather than two-way integration why? Because actually in the absence of, uh, you know, integration policies, uh, the, we have the emergence of individual strategies of integration. In Vienna, the so-called Red Vienna, we have the promotion, the promoting cultural diversity and multiculturalism, which is a different from the federal approach uh, when it comes to integration. So Vienna, it's a different case in the total picture of, of Austria. Uh, in Vienna, uh, there are specific policies, tailor-made integration measure, measures according uh, to the local special needs and, and conditions. Uh, now, when it comes to Albanian migration patterns, uh, we are talking about assimilation trajectories in both countries, in Greece and Austria. Why? This is also uh, fueled or in a way uh, was held in Quota by weak bonding and bridging social capital of migration of Albanian community in both countries. 
uh, actually what uh, Albanians pursue, it's a hiding, uh, let's say, way of assimilating, assimilation. Uh, they are trying to become invisible. Uh, one of, uh, of, uh, of writer authors that has written uh, extensively of integration of, of uh, Albanians, especially in Italy, called this mimesis. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, we have this kind of asymmetric assimilation. Albanian at the same time are, are the most stigmatized uh, migrant population, especially in Greece and in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. But at the same time, they are the most integrated uh, once, but through assimilation, that's why they are, they are considered uh, uh, in a way integrated. Uh, patterns of transnationalism, transnationalism are different between countries. This is in a way shaped by uh, geographical distances. Actually, Albania and Greece share our neighboring countries. Uh, there are labor market priorities that uh, shape the uh, patterns of transnationalism. Uh, we have two different integration regimes. In Greece, we have a precarious uh, uh, legal status with uh, temporary resident permits instead of a permanent, uh, let's say, status, status of residence. Um, other developments since 2010, like visa-free regime, economic crisis, deregularization, uh, in a way uh, create another speed of transnationalism, especially between Greece and Albania. And actually, what is the picture today? Albanians moving constantly between Albania, Greece, Albania, and Italy, even as I mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, of this lecture, going beyond uh, Italy and Greece and moving to other countries uh, as United Kingdom before leaving, before the Brexit uh, and, and Germany. Um, actually, what is the added value of the study? It's a new typology uh, that interconnect or create a kind of bridge between transnationalism and integration, or try to explore transnationalism uh, uh, by uh, you know, uh, measuring or seeing it from the perspective of integration. So actually, uh, the typology, uh, as you see, uh, uh, in your on your screens is a causal relation between integration and transnationalism. There are three categories: uh, uh, migration pattern, a level of integration or assimilation, and forms of transnational activities. Uh, what uh, is important here is that actually, in the case of Austria, we have a combination of linear and partly resource-dependent transnationalism, while in Greece, the type that prevails is of reactive transnationalism. What, what those types actually mean, mean actually in the Austrian paradigm, uh, we have this linear transnationalism with elements of resource-dependent transnationalism, which means that deeper integration, lesser, uh, lower level of transnational activities. Uh, on the other hand, there are signs and uh, examples of positive relationship between integration and transnationalism, so deeper integration, uh, uh, more transnationalism. But this is uh, the case, especially when it comes to professionals, uh, not the general population. Uh, while in the Greek paradigm, we have a different picture, which is actually called reactive transnationalism. So disintegration because of economic crisis and precarious legal status make migrants much more, let's say, involved in transnational activities so as to make uh, their, to, to, to meet their, to uh, make their, a livelihood or to continue their upward mobility uh, by moving to other countries or returning back to Albania. That's it. Uh, I hope you, uh, it was an interesting presentation and probably uh, uh, introduced to you some new things about Western Balkans uh, migration. Um, Ricard, uh, I finish here. So I am uh, keen and very interesting in uh, taking questions and comments and uh, trying, you know, to 
make our inter, let's say, uh, connection a little bit more vivid and uh, lively. Thank you very much, Eda, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And, and now we open the floor for people. Who, I have already one uh, in my screen, but uh, maybe we can motivate people to, uh, uh, to participate. I know that uh, this mean is not so, uh, uh, so nice uh, and, uh, for the interaction because uh, interaction is, is a bit uh, virtual, but uh, I think uh, we are not other options. Uh, uh, at the moment, I have just one question, but uh, I motivate people to, to give more. Uh, the first question I have, uh, it comes from Eva Fortes, uh, who I is see, a, a UPF uh, uh, PhD candidate. You can see it uh, also. Uh. Yes, yes. So um, she actually is asking, uh, yeah. how it's, are you defining, determining? Yes. Yeah. Levels of integration and how what does low middle level mean uh, versus I? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some clarification about that. Uh, I think it is related to the last, uh, okay, your, uh, the okay. slide that so, you showed again. I actually uh, go back to the, to the table because actually it is uh, probably uh, she referred to the table. Actually, uh, in order to uh, structure this typology, uh, I tried to measure up the level of integration. So actually in order to measure the level of integration, uh, you see there are three uh, categories of migrant uh, migration patterns periodic seasonal circular which means that actually those migrants uh, do not uh, have hold solid resident permit so the rights are in a way restricted which means that we have no integration here i think this is clear uh, when we talk about temporary migration patterns, so migrants living in a country or having a kind of resident permit for two years, for instance, uh, so actually we have low to medium level of integration. Why? Because as you very well know, in order to start up, to initiate the integration trajectory, you have to have, you have to hold a kind of stable legal status, which actually make you eligible for uh, you know, uh, uh, programs of integration, for actually uh, becoming part of the uh, reality of the country of uh, of uh, in the in the country of destination. For instance, if you are not, if you have not a long term resident permit, actually your uh, access to labor market is restricted. Your resident permit permit, if it expires, it means that you have to have another contract, work contract, in order to renew it. So actually, your status is temporarily, is, is, is precarious, which means that probably you are not, uh, um, you do not know the language or, or you, have no, you have no proficiency in, uh, in, of the language of the country of, desti of destination, which means that probably your family is somewhere else and you are actually working only in the country of destination. In a nutshell, it means that your integration, it's not, uh, fully uh, full-fledged in country of destination. That's why uh, I put, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm actually measuring in a way uh, the level of integration uh, by characterizing this temporary migration pattern as low to medium. You know that integration, it's, um, uh, uh, you know, all-encompassed term. It includes uh, labor market integration, it includes identification, it includes uh, social integration in means of political participation, social participation, in means of housing, in means of education, uh, in means of uh, um, professional education and the professional training uh, and so on and so forth. So actually when a migrant, it's not subject of this all encompassing let's say, integration measure, it's, it's a logical, uh, let's say, um, assumption that actually we are talking about low to medium integration. And when we talk about permanent integration, permanent migration pattern, it means that a, a migrant, it's both can have, can hold a permanent resident permit or a citizenship of a country of residence, which means that we're talking about a medium to high level or complete assimilation which is one of the, uh, let's say, characteristic of Albanian migration. 
I don't, uh, if you, uh, I don't know if I answered, the fully answered to your question, but at least this is uh, my explanation on uh, actually um, creating the scale of, uh, of level of integration. Okay, thank you, Eda. Eva, maybe you can react uh, if you want to do some more clarification and so on, but uh, in any case, uh, uh, we are we open the floor also for the questions. Uh, some other questions could arise, uh, maybe from other people. Um, there have been uh, several issues uh, related to migration system, uh, comparative also, uh, uh, Albania, Greece, Vienna, and also the two capital uh, uh, cities. It would be interesting to draw a comparative uh, comparison yeah. between, uh, let's say, Spain and Greece, because actually, yeah. when we uh, talked about uh, <laughs> EU migration system, remember the typology. Uh, so Greece yeah, is part yeah. of, uh, yes, actually. Yeah, they, uh, they belong to the same system, because I, I, I saw that they belong to the same system, uh, according to, to your typology of your system. So, Eva Fortes, uh, thank you. Uh, so I understand that they... Uh, you, you can read uh, maybe the Eva Forte's uh, reaction. Eh? I understand the definition you are using of integration are tied uh, directly to the patterns of migration Language. and visa residency status rights, eh? rather than looking at each of these dimensions uh, 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 you mentioned eh? just now, uh, language level market. Yes, so just to make a clarification here, of course, that uh, in the book, that uh, uh, was the result of this uh, study, as I mentioned at the beginning, which was funded mm -hmm. by uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences. Actually, there is a chapter that compare all, uh, let's say, the uh, um, in, uh, all, all those, let's say, uh, categories of language learning, of uh, access to education, uh, social and uh, political participation, access to citizenship. Uh, so, yes, you are right, Eva, but uh, this is, a, in a way, uh, an overview of the study. So uh, there is no time to go, you know, in detail when it comes to uh, actually how I, um, I explore, explored all these, let's say, uh, components of integration process. Thank you. Some other questions, reactions? Clarifications. I know, for instance, just you know, to open up a little yep. bit the discussion. Yep. I know, for instance, that there is um, uh, migration from the Balkans uh, in Spain. I know, for instance, there is a well-established uh, Bulgarian community Bulgarian, in yeah. Spain, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, again part of the Balkan Peninsula, not of Western Balkans, because both Bulgarians and Ru Romanians are. Uh, EU citizens, which means they are eligible for, you know, uh, to, to move free within the Schengen zone. Uh, but actually, you uh, in Spain, there is a, you have an, uh, also an experience in dealing with um, migration from the Balkans. Um, yeah. At the same time, you have also a different um, migration pattern because actually you. Uh, uh, you know, people from Morocco, from Algeria, uh, if I'm correct, or from other countries, uh, or from uh, Latin America, that probably you have specific or, you know, particular links in terms of language. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, this was one of the questions that I was uh, thinking uh, when you have the, 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 the historical link or the cultural link, eh, when, when you are building migration systems, uh, um, uh, okay, you, you can use a uh, geographical location and so on, but uh, also I think um, uh, the, the historical link is strong. Huh? And then I, I was just wondering, um, okay, you, you refer to the historical link between Albania and Greece, uh, of course, and then we can understand this, uh, this migration system huh? between or the link between uh, Albania and, uh, and uh, Greece. But maybe it has been less clear uh, the relation between Albania and uh, and Austria uh, um, or, or Vienna uh, in this case. Uh, maybe you can extend more these uh, these links uh, comparatively. Uh, it's an interesting point, an interesting question mm -hmm. because uh, yes, indeed, uh, I mentioned something. Uh, I pointed out to the historical links between. Um, 
uh, West Balkans countries. I mean, it, but, but in our case, we are talking about Albania with Austria, because uh, actually in the end of, two, of 19th century, the beginning of 20th century, it was very, uh, let's say, uh, it was the era of the emergence of nation states in the Balkans. Uh, after the dismantle or the collapse of, Pot of Ottoman Empire. And uh, Austro-Hungary played a crucial historical law role in the Balkans when it comes to the recognition of Albanian nation state. The same happened, the same cultural links uh, uh, are still solid uh, between Austria, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Austria and Serbia, Austria and Croatia and Slovenia, but Slovenia, uh, it's a different story, but uh, I'm just talking, um, tr trying to put my, um, uh, uh, my uh, Albania in the mm -hmm. general framework of the, of the connection and uh, historical links with uh, Austria and Austrian-Hungarian uh, empire. Uh, actually, from historical point of view, Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, was the one that actually made possible uh, for Albania to become an independent nation state. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russian Empire, because you know that uh, actually Ottoman Empire uh, had, uh, you know, uh, lost the war with Russia, and uh, the, the countries of former Yugoslavia were in a way allies to the Russian Empire at that time. So it's a huge story. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, in 20th century, the beginning of 20th century, uh, the elite of Albanian uh, state at the time uh, were in a way embraced and um, supported by uh, Austrian. Uh, we have investments of, um, of Albanian elite in, the, in Austria. And today we have uh, banks, you know, other capitals, uh, investments coming from Austria to Albania. Uh, our, let's say, cultural interaction uh, is very, very vivid between both countries. Uh, so both Greece and Austria has a solid uh, presence today in Albania from cultural and economic point of view. I actually, uh, I see... Uh, a question from Aida Casanovas. Uh, she actually, uh, I would like to ask whether you choose Vienna and Athens because you are already expected a high number of Albanians in these yeah. two cities. Uh, they are as they are capital cities, or did you consider any other destination cities? And how do you think that this might have affected the results? Thank you, uh, Aida. Thank you for uh, um, coming up with this question because actually. Uh, my, uh, my research is not a quantitative one, it's a qualitative one. So actually, uh, there is a kind of bias if you, if, if you talk about qualitative research. So actually, I choose uh, uh, Vienna and Athens because, uh, of course, I have done a lot of research on Italy and, and Greece. Mm -hmm. In the case of, of, uh, of Austria, why I choose to compare uh, um, Austria and Greece and uh, Vienna and Athens having as a, uh, as a case study Albanian migrants. Why? Because actually we, uh, uh, there is no research done on Albanian migration to Austria. First, second, I, would, I, I was very interested in comparing two different uh, integration, migration integration regimes and the outcome. So that's why I choose uh, both countries and both cities. And that's why I had as, in, as let's say, uh, uh, an initial or as an umbrella uh, analytic framework, the migration system, so as to try uh, and, you know, try to compare from the macro perspective to different migration and integration regimes. So it's not... Uh, quantitative research, which means that numbers doesn't are irrelevant. We know that from method, from you know research science methodology, you know very well that actually when it comes to uh, uh, multi-sided and um, uh, qualitative interview, uh, it means that actually you interact with your subjects, and that's why uh, it was my decision uh, to, 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 to do this research, to conduct this research, including those uh, countries and those cities. 
Thank you, Eda. Maybe I will, I will, I will add some questions myself because I, I was just wondering uh, about the, the, the migration system uh, theoretical framework huh, of the beginning of your lecture. And then um, um, maybe you can introduce more information because you, uh, you say, of course, if, if I understood that um, it is uh, three ways, uh, migrants, uh, country of destination and country of, uh, of uh, origin. Huh? Um, maybe we have learned a lot about uh, Athens, about Vienna, about, uh, about uh, Greece and, and about Austria, but uh, what about Albania itself, uh, the, 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 the political and the governance uh, of, uh, of the one migrants outside? Huh? Because of, uh, from my point of view, the idea of transnationalism is connection, of course, but uh, it, it has to be uh, also some relation uh, um, between uh, the country of origin and the country of, uh, of uh, destination. And in this case, I would like to know about uh, the Albanian policy towards uh, Albanians uh, abroad, or this kind of uh, what we call diaspora policy huh? um, uh, uh, in this time, because we, um, we are not listening about that huh? uh, yes. from, from this side, huh? to complete the migration uh, system. Of course. And of course, if we talk about transnationalism, diaspora policies are of utmost importance uh, because actually, uh, uh, what's the interesting point comparing or trying to eat to, to connect integration with transnationalism is, is exactly uh, knowing or acknowledging the fact that we are talking about transnational space that is, you know, going beyond the national borders of one country, either destination or, uh, you know, of origin. Uh, we are talking about a new, let's say, uh, transnational society. And in order this transnational society to be managed in a way or to get shape or uh, to be functional, uh, you, uh, we need you know, to take into consideration not, not only the country of destination, as I mentioned before, and the relevant policies when it comes to integration, uh, but also what are the policies of uh, origin country in a way in capitalizing on the capital or transnational activities of uh, its citizens, like uh, you mentioned the case of Albanian government and Albanian migrants everywhere in the world. Yes, indeed, uh, after 25 years of migration experience, um, in, it was in 2015, 2016, when Albanian um, state uh, acknowledged finally that there is a huge capital, human capital, um, economic capital, uh, which was till then uh, just recognized uh, in terms of remittances, which are a very important economic indicator uh, when it comes to the, uh, to the economic uh, 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 system and economic um, uh, market in Albania, but at the same time, how to capitalize in terms of uh, education, in terms of uh, uh, know-how and so on. And it was in 2017, 2018, uh, when actually the Albanian uh, government uh, introduced a new, let's say, uh, Ministry of Diaspora. And what uh, uh, Ministry of Diaspora uh, is actually doing is trying to uh, create a, this kind of interconnection between migration community, Albanian migration community abroad and the Albanian government. And the, uh, the historical on the moment, uh, the, mo the, the most crucial momentum is today, this year, because for the first time, um, actually Albanian citizens abroad are entitled to vote at least uh, okay. This is the uh, a prerogative uh, of um, of the new law uh, that they can vote from uh, where they are, uh, which means that if, for instance, one million five hundred Albanians uh, are can vote, you can understand what the impact of this new capital, which was maturate abroad, how can impact the democratization of Albania. Mm -hmm. So in April, uh, there is a general election in Albania, and we all are, uh, in a way, are waiting to see 
uh, about technical issues, how those people are going to vote in the uh, coming elections in April 2021. And of course, this is an historical moment for the first time they are entitled to vote. Let's see uh, via which, uh, through a post or in electronic way, we don't know yet. Um, uh, but the main point actually is that um, uh, the challenge uh, ahead uh, of Albanian uh, government is uh, how to capitalize on the economic capital uh, coming from, from abroad, which means you know very well uh, the connection between um, re uh, remittances and, uh, and local development. And according to, <clears throat> to research and studies done so far, actually rem rem remittances, remittances are channelized or are used only for micro or meso level, uh, to meet micro or meso level needs of the population, which means buying a house, uh, other commodities, but not uh, in favor or used in uh, in order to uh, uh, to create or to uh, help or to boost the infrastructure of Albanian state, which is a, a kind of lose lose situation. So actually, there is let's say a kind of sensibility uh, uh, when it comes to Albanian government, but of course, uh, as you know. Albania is still uh, a country that uh, is uh, uh, under the process of transition from a communist one to, uh, like, let's say, a democratic system. We are st <laughs> we still have a long way, uh, you know, to walk in order to meet to be a functional democracy. Yes, Ricard. Okay, thank you for for this uh, question, and then we learn a lot about. Uh, uh, if I understood, the, the Ministry of Diaspora exists in, in, uh, mm -hmm, in Albania. Mm -hmm. of, uh, and then uh, uh, completely uh, devoted to, uh, to Albanian diaspora and to, and to, um, and to yes. keep contact. Because uh, what I was uh, thinking is about transnational. Transnationalists could be an individual option for most people, or for most Albanian uh, living in Greece and, and Austria. But uh, it, it is also the the outcome of a policy, because uh, the, the, if I understood the, the government, the Albanian uh, government uh, is, is making uh, different uh, policies to keep people contact with their own country uh, and not to lose them in one way or another. Uh, for, uh, and, and then from this perspective, I, I, I found it uh, very interesting. But I was also wondering about, uh, about uh, because I, I know uh, through your, uh, your own uh, research work, uh, that you have been uh, uh, um, uh, doing uh, things about about associations, uh, and then we we know very little about uh, about Albanian associations. Uh, uh, and maybe you can uh, maybe uh, give us some uh, some uh, some uh, keys uh, about uh, Al some Albanian uh, associations in, in particularly in Athens and Vienna, and how. Uh, how uh, functionally, I would say, uh, this association also um, influence uh, the, um, this pattern of integration that you are you are uh, uh, speaking about. Eh? Uh, another interesting uh, aspect of Albanian migration. I uh, I already mentioned some uh, I um, some detail uh, some details about um, Albanian patterns of integration or assimilation. Indeed, uh, Albanian migration is seen or, or is characterized by weak bonds and bridge capital, um, which yeah. means that um, there is no well-articulated uh, social capital in terms of uh, uh, organization or association, so as to put forth and forward uh, and try to negotiate their rights in the countries of destination. This is uh, one of the most, let's say, black pages of Albanian migration. Of course, this is not happened by coincidence. Uh, this has to do with um, the dialectal trajectories, trajectory, sorry, of how Albania evolved throughout the communist regime, which in the name of, um, you know, a uh, cooperatives and communists and uh, collectivity as it was propagated by the communist regime, uh, the individual, let's say the individuality was actually uh, trapped in the, in, in, the, in the name of collectivity. 
And uh, as a reaction to this, uh, let's say, painful process uh, of uh, during the communist era, actually Albanians are, um, are it's a, I called it the syndrome of orphan, which means that once they migrate somewhere else, they try to be invisible, as I mentioned before. They try to change their names. There is a very characteristic um, element of migration, of Albanian migration in Greece. They change immediately their names from Ilir or Teuta. Uh, they uh, became uh, Yanni, Costa, uh, I don't know, Pascalis, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the same time, they change their religion if there was any um, trait mm -hmm. of religion, because Albanians are not a religion people. Uh, generally speaking, but in, in, in the name of becoming invisible and becoming more native than natives, actually they uh, embrace, they adapted everything, culturally speaking, so as to become invisible, which means that actually the collective capital uh, is somehow lost in the name of assimilation. The same, uh, this is much more um, accentuated in the case of Greece, at a lesser extent in case of Italy. Why? Because there is a kind of interaction be between the social capital bringing with them from the origin country and how this social capital coming from origin country was blended with the uh, 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 social capital in the country of destination. We know very well that in Greece, especially in Greece, but also at some extent in Italy, we have a weak civil society. So this combination of the weak, uh, let's say, collective capital uh, coming from the country of origin combined with, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, uncharted waters or not so solid or consolidating civil society in the countries of destination, I'm talking about especially Greece and at a lesser extent Italy, uh, create this kind of, uh, let's say, problematic uh, map of association, especially, especially in Greece. Okay. Maybe I have uh, no, no more questions, but maybe I will formulate a, a last question because uh, I take the opportunity that we have you and, uh, and uh, and we know so um, so so much about uh, Morocco and so on, but so few about the uh, Balkans. Uh, and uh, uh, Balkans are also a uh, transit uh, exactly. region. Uh, exactly. Uh, um, because most of the refugees uh, coming uh, to Europe, uh, uh, one of the last uh, stop are from uh, Balkans uh, in this sense. I don't know what is the situation in this moment about that, about this... Uh, this uh, transit uh, uh, space and uh, what what is the, the the role of different countries because I guess that in Albania uh, this transit uh, uh, um, uh, um, is not so uh, strong than uh, maybe in other part of the Balkans. Uh, uh, I wonder um, okay what are the differences uh, even uh, internal differences within the Balkan but also the role of the Balkan as a transit, eh? as a board of Europe and as a transit, uh, also a space. Eh? Uh, a very Is interesting a question. Mm -hmm. A very interesting okay. question and comments at the same time, because uh, actually um, taking as a reference point what happened in the Balkans in 2016, uh, 2015, 2016, when Albania, or Albania, uh, the, the Western Balkans, where yeah. uh, you know actually became a transit countries, uh, uh, let's say a bridge of uh, asylum seekers and refugees uh, coming uh, mostly from Syria, uh, using or um, uh, you know um, passing through this Balkan corridor to reach countries of of Central Europe, uh, especially Germany, and. Uh, from countries of uh, send from sending countries, uh, Balkan countries of Western Balkans overnight became transit countries, and actually it was in 2018 uh, I was part of the research team led by uh, University of Università di Bologna. Uh, we did a, a, a study on. Um, uh, to say it in a more sim in, in a simple terms, how Balkans, uh, especially I'm talking about Al Albania, 
Kosovo, uh, North Macedonia, and Bosnia Herzegovina, and Montenegro to some extent, uh, can uh, become uh, countries of uh, of uh, uh, destination countries for people, for for migrants, uh, for mixed migration flows that actually are stand are stuck uh, in the Balkans. You know about Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are some camps there. There are some small camps in Albania. There are other camps in in Serbia, uh, with uh, uh, people coming from. Um, from Turkey that are actually, you know, cannot uh, uh, continue their journey to to, work, to, to, to Central Europe. Yeah. And um, indeed, uh, we see from the public discourse in all countries of Europe, of the Western Balkans, that there is a kind uh, of, let's say, debate about if those countries can accommodate, which means integrate. Mm -hmm. uh, so from transit country become host countries. Uh, so, uh, there is an ongoing debate. Uh, uh, of course, those countries uh, are still, uh, let's say, countries that are sending people again. So you know, people that actually are moving from, uh, not so massively, but also, there are still flows that are uh, leaving uh, Western Balkans uh, to go to some to migrate to some other countries. At the same time, the economic landscape, the labor market -like landscape. Uh, of those countries is still a very unregulated, which means that there is no, let's say, uh, um, a functional way to integrate those people. So actually, you are you you are right in making uh, a point on the future of the of the West Balkans as a bridge or as a gatekeepers uh, of um, uh, new flows of. Uh, mixed migration flows from coming from Middle East. Uh, yet we have, um, there are smuggling rings, uh, there are uh, incidents, uh, hate speech, uh, you know, uh, uh, against accommodating people coming from Middle East. At the same time, we have violence uh, exercise or violence of police and military forces of Bulgarian or Albanian or North Macedonia against uh, migrants coming, trying to uh, cross the borders uh, with Greece, you know, and to find a way to reach the, uh, uh, Germany and other countries. So it's a very uh, difficult or very, let's say, challenging landscape. No clear uh, trends. There is a mix of fear, uh, the mix of lack of uh, knowledge and infrastructure to deal uh, with uh, unexpectedly with uh, migration flow. Uh, they have not acknowledged the fact that they, they are ready to accommodate uh, people coming from uh, you know, other countries. Uh, so actually, uh, again, I don't think that Western Balkans is um, a proper place for new migrants, let's say, to uh, integrate. So this is my explanation, but of course the, the situation is much more complex than than that. And no, there are... yeah, at least we have uh, the, the first uh, the, the first uh, input about that. But in any case, we are we are very close to the end because uh, we received the instruction that at the eight o'clock uh, this would be the uh, we need to close uh, and, uh, the lecture and leave me just. Uh, um, thank you again uh, for, for this lecture and, and also of, uh, thanks uh, to EMA to receive you. And uh, for me, it has been also this kind of effort to, to try to, uh, uh, to, um, to, to look at the Mediterranean, but not always uh, within the same countries. Uh, because when we speak about Mediterranean issue, we are always uh, thinking about the South and North, uh, and we are always thinking about Muslim, about Arabic, about these kind of things. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, with this lecture, we, uh, we can have also another, another picture that because the Mediterranean is also the Balkan, is also East and West uh, also. And uh, from this point of view, we, we have uh, so, so much to, to learn about the Balkan. Uh, because uh, from the point of view of research, uh, even in Spain, um, but uh, um, even for, for, for the political point of view in Europe, uh, it is a very unknown uh, region uh, from this point of view. And I think uh, you, you, are, you are perfectly covered uh, this, uh, this dimension uh, today. 
thank you for that. And I am sure that uh, people will be motivated to, to go into your, uh, your publications and, and your books uh, and also to learn about, uh, about uh, this uh, region, this Balkan region, which is also the Mediterranean <laughs> and uh, with a big history huh, behind also. And, uh, and not all, always uh, the same uh, the same picture of the Mediterranean about Arabic and and uh, and European and so on. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, maybe we can, uh, uh, if you allow me, uh, for people uh, belonging uh, to the master, if you they want to pursue this uh, this kind of conversation with you, uh, maybe you you are open uh, to receive some question from them and. And whatever um, they, they 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 may need, uh, then we are also open uh, for 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 their needs uh, in general. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Yemet, uh, to receive us. Also, thank you for Ida, and hopefully the next time in person. I hope oh. for that. Uh, <laughs> maybe somewhere <laughs> in person, but hopefully for that, and uh, maybe uh, to motivate you also for a remote meet uh, working papers. Uh, to speak about the Balkan, about uh, yes, it would be uh, interesting. Uh, all that. Uh, I think uh, it is not only for the Euromed bit, but uh, I think uh, you can cover perfectly this dimension. And I am sure uh, you will uh, found uh, an audience for that because uh, it is very unknown uh, region uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean. Thank you for that. And nothing more. Uh, good luck for everybody. Uh, thanks for the audience to be there. And um, and the next time, and, and the next uh, and, and the next lecture will will come uh, soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.